One of the most anticipated launches of a ship in the 20th century was that of the now infamous ship, the Titanic. Infamous because of its maiden voyage, the opulent so-called unsinkable ship hit an iceberg and plunged to the bottom of the Atlantic, killing hundreds of passengers. Now, it may have sunk nearly 100 years ago, but interest in all things Titanic is still incredibly strong. So when we heard about an exhibit of Titanic artifacts that was heading to the Ontario Science Centre, we just had to find out how an exhibit like that takes shape. This is the ill-fated Titanic. After its disastrous maiden voyage, it sat on the ocean floor for generations. Now, after nearly a century, it's about to arrive at a new destination, Toronto. 7 a.m. Saturday morning at the shipping docks of the Ontario Science Centre. Dozens of boxes have to be unloaded quickly, but also very carefully. The artifacts inside are priceless. They are transported around the world in temperature and humidity controlled fine art shipping trucks. Each artifact that's shipped has its own cavity pack space that's custom made for it by our conservators and collection staff. They've got to hurry. In less than an hour, the next truck will arrive and the process will start again. This entire room has to be transformed from a big empty space into a dozen rooms holding a world-class display. And the team has less than 10 days to get it done. Just a few meters away from the Science Center's busy exhibits, technicians are working hard, ready to bring history to life. Probably over 30 people working here on a daily basis. Carpenters, electricians, painters, project managers, designers, collections managers, conservators. There's a master plan for this mammoth project. Michael Dubois knows what it is. It's sitting right in front of him. We design it in 3D, so we make a virtual version of the exhibit. So that way we can try to experience the exhibit before we actually build it. You can walk through it on your computer screen, and then we produce production drawings from there, and then they build exactly what we see on the screen. Everything down to the positioning of the lights is decided on the computer. Here's what visitors would see as they walk through the boiler room. They even brought along an iceberg. Not just a picture of one, this is a real iceberg. Once it's frozen, the ice will be 15 centimeters thick. It'll stay like that for months, even though the air around it will be a pleasant 20 degrees Celsius. It's basically a sheet of aluminum that's laminated to a, a piece of three-quarter inch plywood. And inside that, there are rows and rows of copper lines. They feed refrigerant through those copper lines. It's all powered by a compressor like the ones used to cool big freezers in a supermarket. It circulates the refrigerant, absorbing the heat from the aluminum and keeping the ice frozen. Amazingly, the ice is formed without adding any water at all. It's created right out of thin air. The air around us is, it contains humidity, it contains moisture. So once you have a cold surface for that moisture to condense on, moisture is going to freeze, and that's how they build the ice. Visitors to the exhibit are allowed to put their hand on the ice to see how long they can hold it there. After about five seconds, it starts to get painful. The ice is minus 20 degrees Celsius. That's the same temperature as the salty ocean when the Titanic sunk. It's one of the reasons so many people died. Incredibly, some of the things that did survive 90 years underwater were handwritten pieces of paper. I always joke that I can't find my car keys in my purse, and yet here we are with, with papers and textiles and things that have been at the ocean for 90 years, and we're able to recover them and conserve them and make them so you can read them again. All of the paper and textiles that we have in the exhibition were found inside of a leather satchel, and our conservators have found that the leather that was used at that time repelled the microorganisms that otherwise would have eaten away at the papers and the textiles. Even though the paper survived nearly a century at the bottom of the ocean, it is not indestructible. If designers aren't careful, the lighting itself could damage the delicate paper. All of our theatrical lights are either do not have any UV or have UV filters in them. Anything that's a paper or textiles has to be at an extremely low light level so that it doesn't fade. All these lights and all these wires have to be hooked up to a central computer system in the nerve center. But they have to work quickly because time's running out. After thousands of hours of work, the exhibit's coming together. The iceberg is getting thicker, the boiler room blazes to life, and the dozens of smaller artifacts are encased in glass. Now it's time for the team to put together one of the largest and most valuable pieces of this exhibit, a porthole they salvaged from the original Titanic. 
The porthole is, is generally used at the front of the exhibit. It's a way to kind of set the emotion of the exhibit and, and make people understand that it's really a story um, uh, uh, about the passengers. It, it sets the mood for the exhibit. That glass was actually cracked when we recovered it. Our conservators are careful to conserve and not restore the objects, and so any cracks or things that happened when the ship actually sank are still part of them today. It's what people that were boarding the ship would be looking at, you know, as they were waving goodbye to land. And as you're starting to look through the window, you're starting to board the Titanic.